All right. Good morning, everyone. Those are who are in the in the west coast of Canada. Good afternoon to Human and those who live in the uh, the east, east coast, and also those who live in Europe and then in Asia. Good night. Uh, so uh, <laughs> today, <laughs> uh, it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Mr. Scott Phillips the founder and CEO of uh, Starfish Medicals, uh, a local uh, medical device company. Uh, so Starfish Medical is a, a medical device company in um, uh, in Victoria, and then also they have offices in, in Toronto. Uh, I'll talk about Scott in a bit and how successful he is uh, in terms of his career. Uh, then he will go over all these um, uh his journey during this uh, path of starting starfish and then how it becomes one of the largest biomed uh, 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 medical device companies in canada and i would argue in uh, maybe in north america uh, uh, but before that uh, i would like to go over a few housekeeping slides uh, uh, so as uh, uh, always uh, uh, we will have, uh, if you have any questions during the uh, presentation, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, uh, and, uh, to, to ask your questions. Uh, uh, Scott kindly agreed uh, uh, to, to, for us to record this video and then post it on YouTube. Uh, so the, the, the talk will be posted on our YouTube channel. Feel free to visit it. Uh, again if you want if you miss some part of the talk and uh, and also share it with your uh, with your uh, network uh, also uh, uh, as always please participate in the poll uh, that we have uh, uh, prepared for you uh, so this poll is uh, basically we would like to, in this poll we would like to receive your feedback about the presentation and also the quality of uh, these e-seminar series. So we continuously monitor the quality of these uh, e-seminar series through your, uh, the feedback that we receive from you. And then uh, we will uh, try to improve uh, uh, any, any shortcomings that you may, uh, you may notice. Um, also, our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Komacheva. Uh, she is a professor of chemistry at the University of Toronto, but she, is, she wears another hat as well. She is a serial entrepreneur. She has started a few companies. Uh, and uh, uh, so we will we'll look forward to, to her exciting talk uh, next week. Uh, also, again, uh, if you have any comments, if you have any feedback for us, feel free to contact me. Uh, Dr. Sawuji uh, and, and Vahid, uh, we are the organizers of these e-seminar series. If you uh, think, uh, if you want to receive updates about these uh, about these e-seminar series, uh, you can always follow us on Twitter. Uh, this is our Twitter handle, and then also you can uh, um, uh, uh, follow us on, on LinkedIn as well uh, to receive uh, uh, the uh, most up-to-date information about these e-seminar series. Uh, so uh, as usual, we cannot do this uh, e-seminar series without the support that we receive from our sponsors, our um, uh, continuous sponsor, uh, Montreal Transmet Tech Institute, who has been with us for a, a, a few months now. Uh, is uh, 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 basically aims to support the development of innovative medical technologies, train the next generation of professionals, and make innovation in life sciences and engineering uh, a source of wealth for society. Based on a living lab approach, Transmed Tech provides an integrated environment that supports interdisciplinary collaborative processes and co-creation of new medical technologies and interventions to catalyze their development and adoption by users. Uh, we would like to also uh, acknowledge the support that we have received from uh, the Terestock Institute for Biomedical in Innovation, 
for this talk. Uh, so Teresaki Institute is a nonprofit organization that aims to invent and foster a practical solution that restores or enhances uh, the uh, health of individuals. Uh, the Teresaki Institute for Biomedical Innovation and Visions Award where uh, personalized medicine is available to all. Uh, the Teresaki Institute uh, aims to tackle the biggest problems in health. They are focused on solving problems in new ways, developing personalized solutions, uh, prototyping tangible solutions, and bringing uh, their solutions to the uh, real world. We would like to thank, again, our sponsors. So with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Scott Phillips, uh, the president, founder, and CEO of uh, 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 the founder and CEO of uh, of Starfish uh, uh, Medicals. Uh, uh, Scott holds a degree in engineering physics from the University of British Columbia. Uh, prior to starting Starfish, he worked in diverse areas such as lithium battery development and manufacturing. Uh, uh, UV spectro spectroscopy instrumentation and high five uh, audio speakers. Uh, uh, after uh, establishing uh, Starfish Medicals and under his leadership, uh, the company has grown into a diverse, diverse professional organization with clients around the world and 100% focused uh, on medical devices. Scott is a chair of the Life Sciences uh, British Columbia Board a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, winner of the uh, EY uh, Entrepreneur of the Year and 2017 Pacific Awards and the technology category 2017 recipient of the Viatech uh, Technology Champion Award and uh, volunteers with uh, Junior Achievement uh, uh, Entrepreneurs Organization and the University of British Columbia. So, uh, uh, Scott is 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 a busy uh, busy man. I know that. Uh, but one thing about Scott that uh, is not in was not written in his uh, bio sketch is that he's always uh, he always supports others. He's he's a good mentor as well. Uh, uh, just to give you a, a personal uh, story about my interaction with Scott is that. Uh, uh, although he is very busy, uh, whenever we email him and ask him to to come for a to have a breakfast with us, we, I started a company recently. He came to us. We knew he was busy. He just the company just got this big, you know, contract with the, with the Canadian government. But he comes. He sits with us. He spends a few hours with us, and then he just tells us. Uh, what it thinks about our approach to become successful, and that this is not only me; it's also uh, also he have he uh, his company is dedicated a lot of resources to uh, the students as well. Uh, the University of Victoria and the University of British Columbia, and they have many co-op students joining uh, his company. So it's it's not all about uh, money, in my opinion. It's uh, about you know education and helping uh, others as well and that's that's a great uh, uh, quality that i see in uh, in the in, in scott and then also the uh, starfish medical team so uh, thank you very much scott for uh, accepting our invitation it's a great pleasure to have you here with us and then the virtual floor is yours thank you so much all right let me just see if i can share my screen here How's that look? Okay, well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I understand uh, that the audience is primarily academic. Um, and so I'll try to tailor my con my discussion. That's why I picked the, uh, the topic today of translational tactics for medical technology. I believe I have about 35 more minutes to talk and then we have about 15 minutes for Q and A, is that right? Uh, that's correct. Well, we can go up to uh, uh, as long as, as you have time, but uh, feel free to to go uh, over 35 minutes uh, and then after sure. that. Okay. Okay. Like to go. Thank you. Uh, so I want to address some topics really uh, about how do you spin a company out or be part of a spin out from an academic setting. If you're in an academic setting, how do you how do you think about that? And I've got uh, 
some broader thoughts and then um, uh, I, I brought uh, eight case examples of different spin-outs that uh, I thought I would talk about and then uh, you can reflect on sort of what worked and what didn't work and uh, what we can learn from those plus a few other examples in the middle. So, uh, but uh, to get started, let me go. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mohsen asked me to talk a little bit about how I got to where, where I am. So this is it. This is this is the. Uh, uh, can you see if I if I move a cursor on the screen here? Yeah. So this here is me. This is uh, uh, in the in the late eighties at University of British Columbia working on robotics. Um, and. Uh, oops. And uh, so you can see a variety of things. I actually started my career uh, up in the, the, this, this stuff in the top left up here in lithium batteries. A big startup was happening. It was actually a, a spin out from University of British Columbia at the time. To uh, It was actually one of the early inventors of the lithium battery. You may not realize this, if, uh, but actually there was a time when there was no lithium batteries. And, uh, and that was and so in the 1980s, that all, that all happened. So got a big chance to work on automated equipment and design for manufacturability. I didn't realize how lucky I was because that's those kinds of jobs are not so common in Canada, sort of mass production of high technology devices. Uh, worked in uh, archery equipment, worked in exercise equipment. This is the Reebok Skywalker. Uh, I, uh, this is the, some manufacturing equipment relating to audio speakers. These are the speakers that I worked on for another startup. Um, so that that was pretty interesting as well. It's actually, it's interesting. That was that you see that uh, it's called a stator. That that stamp steel plate on the front of it there. That was one of my designs. And uh, these are these are pretty interesting. I won't get into the technology, but uh, but the industrial designers liked how how much it looked, or they liked they so much liked how it looked that a uh, that they decided to feature it as part of their product. So once in a while, maybe if you make things that make sense magnetically and manufacturing wise, that they, they look beautiful as well. So, so it, you know, in, in engineering, uh, you graduate, you learn all these analytical techniques. Um, and I think universities are doing a better job these days, but the, you know, you graduate and you don't really have the, the skills to actually do engineering decision-making yet. That's something you only pick up by four or five years in the field. And so you got to pay your dues. And uh, so this is how I, how I paid my dues to, to learn how to do that for the first 10 years of my career. Um, so let me tell you a tiny bit about Starfish. So this is a company I founded in 1999. So I was 10 years out of school. And I count the founding as when it moved out of the spare bedroom. Um, we had a we had a baby sleeping at the time. I was uh, sleeping in the living room in a playpen because I had colonized the spare bedroom for an office, and I think maybe some of you can relate to that. And uh, so here we are, 21 years later. Uh, we're a North American leader in our space of medical technology development and biotech uh, 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 instruments as well. Uh, uh, we'll get into the locations in a sec. 100% uh, medical focus on de medical devices and bioservices, uh, but 140 staff. So it's really, although we say it's a big company, it's actually in the realm of business, it's actually a pretty small company. Um, and what we're known for is uh, deep technical capability, complex electromechanical things, uh, things with optics and ultrasound and miniaturized and biotech assays integrated. Uh, we're known for our product definition, particularly we're known for our focus on how to make companies valuable. I'll get into that. And we also have a, a, a new product introduction, low volume manufacturing, both in Toronto and our Victoria. And so where are we? Our headquarters is Victoria, uh, Toronto. Uh, we have a lovely uh, office right in, 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 in close to the subway in Toronto. And... Uh, and we have uh, our business development people. If you were ever to talk to one of them, you might talk to Dave Dobson on the medical device side. Uh, we're just hiring a new one in Boston starting uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> so uh, we are about 80% focused on the US market. So that's, uh, there's a lot of customers there. And, uh, and, we, and the rest of it is, is mostly in Canada, a little bit in Europe and Asia. But when you sell innovation for a living, it's very, very complicated. It's hard to work across uh, language barriers and across long time time zone differences. So, 
because you have to talk a lot. So here's, a, here's some examples to make things a little more real. Um, what sort of products we would work on. And I do have some of these. Some of these actually I have case studies to talk about like, farther on. Uh, this is uh, a device for uh, platelet analysis using backscatter, laser backscatter. So lots of complicated algorithms and uh, and but a lot of you can you can see that they um, how the thing looks how it interacts with the operator those are super important to us as well so one, one of the things I uh, philosophically that as technical people engineers we tend to be very focused on our technical brilliance and our technical solutions we reduce things down to to that and as you work in the field for a while you realize that what actually drives adoption and, and success of spin-outs is as much on solving the broader clinical problem, uh, understanding workflow, understanding ergonomics, making things actually workable for people is maybe more important than your technical brilliance. So you kind of have to learn to get over yourself a little. It's, 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 a, it's a, uh, uh, something, um, it's a process we all go through as, as we mature in, in the industry. Um, this is a company out of UBC called Boreal Genomics. I'll talk about later. Um, yeah, this 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 device here is uh, for uh, looking at blood flow in superficial tissues, which has a very a few important applications. Uh, dental. This is uh, in in theater uh, uh, MRI. Um, uh, the Cyax is a, a, a biological instrument, so all sorts of interesting things. Oh, this was also pretty cool. This is a little miniature catheter for vascular surgery. So you can see there covers a variety of applications. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but in terms of uh, types of clients that we tend to work with, a mix of corporate and startups. And you may recognize some of these names like Medtronic, uh, Stem Cell Technologies, the largest biotech in Canada, Terumo, and also some smaller names you probably haven't heard of because they were startups at the time and many of them were subsequently acquired. In fact, for our startup clients, we have the, we, we, our general objective is to have a client be worth $100 million after, after they're finished their business journey. What can we do to have them be worth $100 million? In fact, over time, we're trying to, that's kind of our next objective, to get to 100 clients that are worth $100 million. Uh, each. So that's a, uh, which when we first started to talk about that, it seemed ridiculous. But uh, now it's it's starting. We just had our second one that uh, went public or sold for over a billion dollars. So I think that uh, it starts to feel very uh, achievable now. That's, that's, I think, one of the important things in business is to be aspirational uh, to the right amount. So uh, what I'd like to talk about with the rest of my time here, some, some further thoughts about university spinouts. Um, some thoughts about venture selection. Um, how do you pick the right company to do? Uh, and having, and then having, having picked the right company to do, uh, what are the thing, how should you think about defining the right product? Uh, and then I'm going to work through about eight examples. So, and then we'll have some time for Q and A at the end. So as we, as I was reflecting on spin-out companies, here's a list of some of the spin-out companies that we've worked on. Uh, all sorts of them um, uh, from different universities all over North America, typically, including Soundbite, which is in Montreal. And um, that's Steve Arl. I don't know if Steve Arliss has maybe spoken to you guys before, but a uh, well known Montreal serial med tech entrepreneur that uh, uh, has been integrally involved in that. <clears throat> um, so as, as we reflected on which ones of these worked out well, some of them, they didn't all work out well, of course, but uh, um, a number of them did. And, and, and one of my biggest reflection about uh, what is required to have a, a successful uh, spin-out company is this, that um, they all have an entrepreneurial professor involved. This is not the domain of, of the, uh, curiosity-driven professor who does research, publishes a paper, gives it to the industry liaison office and says, go license this to somebody. Now that does happen. I shouldn't, I don't, I don't mean to demean anybody who runs their career like that or uh, 
wants to think about their their research and doesn't want to worry about commercial things there are there are times when that works but mostly we that doesn't really turn into companies if they're lucky uh that turns into a license out and everybody moves on with their life uh but if you're interested in having a company and having a successful local company that actually stands up and hires people and does and launches a product um it's my experience is that it's quite rare that the very original thing that you researched and you came up with is what goes to market. It, maybe it's in the right area code, but it's not the right thing. And so you really, most of these companies, they have grad students and they tailor their research somewhat towards what will, what can be commercially uh, successful and what's worth launching. So, uh, um, right now is actually an interesting time in Canada to contemplate, um, you know, there, I think there's a fair number of expat Canadian professors floating around the U.S. right now that would like to come home and some of them would like to start companies and right now is a great time to go hire them. So, in fact, I, I, t I emailed the, uh, the CEO or not CEO, the, the Dean of, of uh, Biomedical Engineering at UBC and I said, hey, if you do you have a really great entrepreneurial professor you want to hire? I'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. Just let's 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 uh, obviously that's not enough to endow a chair or anything, but maybe enough to get the ball rolling. But uh, uh, that's maybe a, my little nationalistic aside. But uh, so uh, uh, Alan Eaves, uh, quite a well-known researcher in Vancouver, who in mid-career decided he was going to start this company called Stem Cell Technologies, and. Uh, and then ultimately moved over to, to run it full time. And now he's got 1,200 employees. It's, it, and they have, they have this unbelievable growth trajectory. They've grown 20% per year for the last 15 years in a row. And they keep doing it year after year after year. And now at this point, if you want to take a company with 1,000 people or 1,500 people and add 20%, that's a lot of new PhDs they got to hire. In fact, I think they hire more PhDs than Google does in Canada. So that's a, that's a really interesting. Uh, uh, company. And so that's a perfect example of somebody. He's, he's just, he's basically single-handedly created this industry. Um, Rick Manga, I'll talk about from Novadac. Andy Hoffer, a company called Lung Pacer. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, Bill Walker, a, he was at the time when he started a couple of companies I'll talk about. He was a professor at University of Virginia. Uh, Andre Marziali is a professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, John Remmers is a, a professor at the University of Calgary, and he was the inv inventor of CPAP, which is the uh, continuous positive airway pressure for sleep, sleep apnea. And Elizabeth Maurer created a company called Light Integra Technologies. So anyway, I hope I, make, hope I, I made my case that uh, you can't just be partially involved. You've got to be pretty committed to, if, as a professor to make these things happen. And I'll give you a couple, some thoughts about how to pick what to do in a sec. And the second point I want to make is that when they find there's kind of this triad really for a med tech thing um so you've got the you've got the entrepreneurial professor they don't have to quit their job or anything they just have to agree that they want to do uh, uh research that focuses on what will make this company successful um and you ha then when you you have to pick what ceo you want to work with what entrepreneurial founder of your company you want to work with and uh, there's kind of a, a, a this idea that if you find somebody who's worked for Medtronic or Stryker or something like that, that 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 pedigree that that will bring you success. But actually, it's a different thing. A, so a startup entrepreneur is quite different from a corporate manager, and so just that's about, so finding somebody who's actually done a successful startup before that's your best determinant of success, especially, especially if it's in that in the area. And the third part I didn't have a slide for is really probably a clinical expert that relates to the field, whatever it is. Um, and what, they don't really need to be full-time in the company either. They just need to be an expert in the, in the field of kidney disease or ophthalmic surgery or whatever the, whatever the thing you're working on is. And, and uh, I, I, that would be my recommendation. So let me give you a few thoughts about venture selection. So, uh, I, I, for this slide, I used a, a fellow named Amr Salier. I don't, you, 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 you probably don't know the name. He's not famous, but he's, he's an incredibly successful uh, uh, startup incubator. And uh, 
he's actually from Syria originally, but he, he came to North America as a child and uh, graduated as an engineer in Cleveland and uh, went to work in the, in the interventional cardiology uh, business and was involved in a couple of startups there just as an employee. And then he branched out and started starting companies, which is actually, if you look statistically at serial medtech entrepreneurs and what they did in their early career, uh, you'll find um, that they tend not to have started straight out of university. They tended to, they went to work for a company for a while and learned how to do the medical device business because it's complicated. And then they branched out into entrepreneurship. So on the right side of the slide here, you can see the uh, five companies uh, that at the time I made this slide had all exited for hundreds of millions of dollars, each of them. And, and on the left is the six companies that he has started now that he's actively working on six different companies, um, mostly in, in interventional cardiology and a couple of in ophthalmology. Um, so this is, this is a kind of a remarkable thing. So um, a couple of thoughts that I have on this, I've basically got uh, four thoughts. So one is the um, uh, financial value proposition. If you're trying to pick a thing that you're going to do, um, it may sound obvious, but it's incredible how many people don't get this right. Um, how, is, how is it generally going to work financially? Um, who's going to pay for it? How much and how much benefit do they get? Uh, uh, what, what, what you find in med tech uh, is that the, the, um, the buying landscape is quite siloed. And so, uh, and the, and so it tends to be uh, uh, fee for service type reimbursements. So uh, if, if, if you're selling to a hospital and, they're, and you're selling them a new system for managing knee surgery or something, um, will they get the benefit of that? Because if, if the benefit flows to the patient over time, maybe then the implant works better or something like that, um, or they don't need as much rehab, does the buyer benefit? And, if, and oftentimes the, it's actually the case, the buyer doesn't actually benefit or only in very specific jurisdictions where they pay differently or something. So you need to have a very clear eyed view of how your innovation actually is, can, can be adopted by anybody. And if, it can't, if, it, if you can't make that story work, you're probably not going to spend 10 years fighting against the reimbursement agencies. I would suggest this is just one of those check boxes as you think about what, what company to start. If you can't figure out how to make it work, then don't worry about it. Go find something else. Like the world is full of different things you can do for a medical device startup. It doesn't have to be the, the first thing you thought of. Um, um, then the next piece is, is there a big enough market to be worth doing? And this is another area where people get uh, really screwed up. Um, uh, you know, they did their master's thesis in something or or they've, they've published a bunch of papers on something. Uh, they've been able to give presentations or conferences on it. And what it relates to is cystic, uh, cystic fibrosis diagnostics or something or uh, where you get like a few people out of a million have this disease. Um, uh, it's, it's really hard to string it together and make it into a, a successful commercial venture. And you won't be able to find investors. Um, or you have a, a lot of difficulty with it. And, uh, you know, you can't really help anybody, no matter how you're motivated, you can't help anybody if you can't find a way to have it adopted. So, um, uh, so there's at some level, there's got to be a business aspect of, it, of any of these things to drive them into the market so you can have an impact. And then the, the, the other concept I'll, I'll, I'll leave is, some things want to be products and some things want to be companies. And people early on in their, um, in their entrepreneurial careers often mix these up. Um, a company is a standalone entity that will have salespeople in the field and so on. Um, and will get sold as a company or, or grow up as a company. A product doesn't need all the same infrastructure. You already, you, and uh, I'll get into the buyer as my final thought on this. But uh, um, um, so, so if you're designing a, a product that will fit in somebody else's sales bag, then you design your company quite differently. I mean, it's still incorporated as a company. What I mean is it won't be a standalone entity in the long term. Uh, really, you're just 
what you're making is a, is a specialty instrument that, that will be carried by a salesperson who visits radiology suites or, uh, or emergency medicine conferences or whatever, whatever call points they have. Um, so understanding the buyer, and uh, one of the reasons I put Amr on the slide here is because uh, he always likes to exit pre-revenue. That's it's kind of a unique situation. And, uh, uh, and he sells companies for hundreds of millions of dollars pre-revenue, which most commonly we actually see exits uh, after market validation. Um, so uh, understanding right at the beginning who the buyers are, are there at least two or three buyers that all want the product? You understand how it will fit their, their portfolio and uh, and it seems clear they would have a desire to do that. Because if you can't paint that picture from beginning to end, the, ser the successful serial entrepreneurs don't even start, right? Um, so I, I asked him, I mean, how many things do you kill? In fact, if you want, if you go to our website, you can see I did an interview with him. Uh, he went on, he went live just like this, and it was a Q and A. Uh, and I asked him, uh, how do you decide what to kill? He says, oh, it's 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 kind of sad, like all these things have big markets, but if we don't understand how the buyer is going to make their decision, then we kill it. And I thought, oh my gosh, that, isn't that amazing? Like it's nothing about the technology or the number of potential patients or the reimbursements or the, the margins or all the other things we all get wrapped up on. It's really, if you can't understand how this thing, how the story ends, then he doesn't start. And so I, uh, anyway, I'll leave it, I'll leave you with that as far as broader thoughts on venture selection. But uh, I think, um, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple more comments as we go. So um, here's an interesting case from a few years ago. It's called AccuMap. It's a way to think about this problem. This is a company out of, out of Australia. You can tell by the size of the monitor. It was a little bit long, a little, little time ago, although they picked the monitor because it was fast. And so what they do is objective perimetry. So in, the, in ophthalmology, there's uh, devices that, that sense the sensitivity of the, uh, the retina, uh, not, not in the fovea, but at all the, and, and there's a lot of degenerative uh, retinal diseases. And uh, you can see, uh, and they allow you to, to map out to de 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 the degeneration of macular uh, AMD or, or, or glaucoma. And uh, so these guys came up with a way to do it objectively. Instead of a patient seeing little flashing lights um, and pushing a little button, but you never know really whether they're looking, um, this thing would flash a checkerboard pattern at them and sense with electrodes uh, the uh, visually evoked potential and uh, objectively measure this for the first time ever. And they went to commercialize this, and this was distributed by a company we partnered with at the time. So we got to see it firsthand. And they had a horrible tie in the market, basically completely failed in their North American launch. And you, they ask, well, why is that? And, uh, you know, they made, they made good enough margins. Uh, there's a reimbursement to pay for doing it. Um, uh, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it, it, should be, it should be a slam dunk. <clears throat> and the answer is a couple things. Um, first of all, um, at the time, you're not really you're not really driving a a, a real diagnostic decision, um, uh, but most importantly, it actually costs more to deliver that deliver the therapy or not the therapy. The, the now you have to have a tech there the whole time, whereas before it used to just just they used to just uh, set them up and walk away. So it's more expensive to deliver, and the doctors didn't understand the benefit. So it's actually it's actually a wonderful example where. This thing, look at all the money they spent on this product, millions and millions of dollars to get it to this spot and figure out distribution relationships and everything. And yet it had this fundamental flaw in the venture selection process that it actually, it, uh, there may, they, it was too early. There was, no real, there was no real therapy to go with their diagnosis. In fact, if you understood the market, you'd understand that the reason people were doing this perimetry is more because they get paid to do it than anything else. Um, but no, there's more. So I propose to you, especially as academics, you are master uh, pattern recognizers. You know exactly what you can uh, publish a bunch of papers, get some grad students to join your lab. What what research area seems like a, a, a productive roll of the dice? 
that's the same thing for venture selection. It's just, it's just like that. It's no harder. It's just a different set of patterns. There's no magic to it. Once you've done it a couple of times, then it's all becomes fairly obvious to you. So now let's, let's swing over to, to the product definition side. Um, so how would you, how would you, how would you think about uh, what your product should be like? And, uh, and this is a process we use at Starfish, which we call Pathfinder. Uh, these are basically just investigation areas to think about. And we have got a bunch of details behind all these, which I don't have time to go into today. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, what, what's the use of the technology, um, really understanding human factors, user needs, the workflow. What is the things that people complain about now in that procedure? Spending a lot of time clinically is super important. And of course, understanding the intellectual property landscape. Uh, and it's not about, can you get a patent? It's, can you get a patent that blocks everybody else from, from doing this same type of thing? Right? It's gotta be really useful. Otherwise, if you don't have a really useful patent, you really wanna ask yourself, uh, uh, should you start? Uh, uh, we call it disposable strategy or consumables. How do you get paid every time you do one of these? It's often super critical to uh, uh, to making a procedure work. And sometimes you have algorithms that reside in the cloud and data goes up and diagnostic and something or other comes back, or there's a there's a, a consumable, uh, uh, whatever, little eye cup or something for every procedure. Somehow there's gotta be a way to get paid for everyone. Um, and I won't go into a lot of these. How do, reimbursement strategy is huge. How do you actually, how does anybody ever get paid for this? Uh, value chain and margin. Can you make it in such a way that you can get enough margin? And I'll just give you a quick rule of thumb. If you think the thing is gonna sell for a thousand dollars, you get about eight times less than that to buy parts. And I, I you know, for, if there's a Q and A, I can, I'll be happy to chat or explain why that is later. But uh, unless you can make those numbers work, then keep noodling, you're not there yet. Uh, how are you gonna get through clinical? Uh, how many patients you need to do? Often that's the, the most expensive part. For a lot of uh, more high risk type devices, you spend about three or four times as much on clinical testing as you do on the device itself. And uh, how, do you, how do you sort of map that out? Um, uh, business strategy, who's gonna buy your device? How is this gonna fit into the market? What's gonna allow them to do? Uh, and then there's a whole risk thing, which I won't get into right now. So, uh, but the point is that you have to proceed on a broad front and thinking of it holistically. It's not just solving a technical problem or a very specific clinical problem. It's understanding all of this stuff before you even really get going. And uh, as you get into it, uh, this is a map we use to show the idea of, uh, of phase gates that very, at various times in the, in the process of development and manufacturing transfer, you, you come to these spots where uh, you need to ask yourself, are, are we done with conceptual development? How we identified the key risks? How we adequately mitigated them? How we shown that on, on, in principle, we, can, uh, we could manufacture this thing. Seems like we, uh, there will be a buyer waiting at the end, all that stuff. Uh, that's the conceptual development stage. And then you ask yourself, are we gonna kill it or not, right? Fail fast is one of the things. And uh, uh, you know, we strongly believe in the lean startup methodology. How do you efficiently, most efficiently get to each of these valuation, these uh, milestones? And typically um, these phase gates also correspond to a time when you wanna raise capital. That's when you get more incrementally valuable. But how do you do that most efficiently? Because at the end of the day, as a founder, you want to get your thing adopted, but you also want, like if you're going to make a valuable company, you want to still own a bunch of it at the time, right? So th there's a lot of strategy involved in that, which I'm happy to answer questions about later. So here's what things typically look like in phase zero or conceptual development. This is a, uh, um, a intravascular ultrasound application we were working on, and this is at Stanford University. This is a interventional cardiologist, and this is the prototype that we're showing him. And if you look closely at it, you can see that, that the interface is just printed out on paper and the, uh, the cart is just made out of little plastic pipes and stuff. It's, it's, there's no point in spending a bunch of money making a high fidelity prototype. If you, all you wanna do is experiment with how they would interact with the device, make it as cheap and fast as you can. 
Um, this is what, what it looks like when you have a human factors person talking to a bunch of uh, circulating nurses that work in this setting. And here we are documenting the actual C arm in the, uh, in the interventional cardiology suite. And um, so really understand how this, uh, how this device really is gonna get used in that setting. So we make sure we design the right thing. We're definitely believers that the technical team should really be very familiar with the use environment. So let me uh, talk to you about a few cases now. So here's a case of Novodak, you may be familiar. Uh, uh, this was actually started in Winnipeg. At, uh, it was a spin out of uh, NRC lab there. Uh, Ian Smith, I believe was the, the uh, guy, the, the, the researcher. And he came up with this, this uh, approach for using uh, fluorescence imaging to look at blood flow. And, it, and uh, it took them a while to figure out what it would be good for. And they narrowed in on, uh, uh, blood flow for skin surgery. And so uh, Rick Mangott was a grad student and he ended up becoming the CEO. They'd never done that before. Uh, but they were able to attract a very experienced CEO, Arun Manawat, to come and uh, be the, the, the face of the company. And they did, and this was the first product and we helped them work on that. And I think we made the first 500 out of all the mechanics in our office, or in our manufacturing plant. And this thing exploded into the market. It did extremely well. And ultimately, uh, they were able to uh, they they were able to go public, um, and then a, a couple of years ago, they were sold to a company called Striker for a billion dollars Canadian, which was at the time the largest transaction in the history of Canadian medtech. So this is a perfect example of a company that did a bunch of things right. They focused on the right the right things at the right times, um, and interestingly enough, the product that actually got Stryker to buy them was not this product at all. They actually took this technology and they adapted it to an endoscopic application. So they could uh, actually help avoid blood vessels when you're doing endoscopic surgery. And that was the thing. So that was actually Stryker um, endovascular that actually, uh, actually bought the company. It was a division that focused on endoscopic surgery. This is what things look like as we're working things out, mapping how this thing will sit in the in the in the uh, in the uh, in the surgery suite. What conceptually it might look like, and then here's what it actually did look like, and uh, so on. Here's another startup that we were involved with, a fellow named Dr. Bill Walker at U University of Virginia. He had a, he at the time we met him, he had. This, these little test tubes, square test tubes, cuvettes that you would sink in a, in a bath of water and fire ultrasound at them. And so um, uh, he actually served as the CEO for a while until the company ultimately was able to raise enough capital that uh, they, were, they brought in another CEO. And uh, one of the interesting things that we realized after a while is that this thing really wanted to have a cartridge, a single use cartridge. And then we had to invent, see these little domes here. Those are actually ultrasound lenses. There's not really any such thing as an ultrasound lens, but so we kind of created that idea of of, of uh, having a transducer approach this these chambers and uh, and fire the ultrasound into the uh, into the blood, and we actually observe uh, pulse by pulse the coagulation of the blood, and uh, ultimately it was uh, commercialized and sold to a company called Stago for I think about 120 million. So it was a good success as well. <clears throat> ArcScan was actually started in a lab at, in uh, Cornell University in Manhattan. Um, and this here is a doctor, Dr. Dan Reinstein, it's right up here. And so it looks a lot like a piece of university apparatus. And so he, he really decided he wanted to take a run at this. And so it was a combination, he's a clinician. Um, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Ron Silverman, who's a researcher. And then they managed to attract this guy, uh, George Wiseman, as a, a serious uh, ophthalmology uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, pr uh, president to come in and built up this company. And this was the very first unit that we made uh, that we took to the American Academy of Ophthalmology show. Uh, and it, it does high, high frequency ultrasound and what it, it, so it makes images like this, which I won't get into today. We're running a little short on time. Um, and based on that, we're able to, to sell enough, essentially sold prototypes, it was kind of a, to researchers, which was just enough to make the company move forward. 
So we made, this is the second generation system. We made 20 or 30. And ultimately the company was uh, sold, acquired by another company. And I'll show you what uh, their commercial product now looks like that you could buy on the market if you want to. It's pretty similar to our initial unit, which, but sophisticated, more sophisticated in some important ways as well. Uh, this is another example of a researcher. Actually, it's a Montreal company at the, what's called Micropharma at the time. And it ended up moving to uh, San Diego. Um, uh, Mitch Jones, professor, or not a professor, he was a, a PhD postdoc uh, researcher uh, working on, on gut health. So they came up with the idea of this ingestible robotic capsule. Um, and then ultimately, we're able, he was able to uh, attract some capital for that, join, uh, they, they got sold or integrated with Progenity Company in, uh, in San Diego. And where they had this, this uh, Dr. Sharat Singh, who's a real innovator in assays. So we were actually able to integrate an assay right into that capsule. So, and you had to figure out all the navigation things that would go into it and so on. How do you know where you are? To, when you get the right spot, grab a sample, do a fully integrated assay of, of what, what's in there. I won't get into the specifics and then radio out the results to your watch. So this is a revolutionary approach. Based on that, they were able to raise $100 million um, and they're still still commercializing that. I, will, I think I'll skip over this example. It's kind of cute. Emporial Genomics uh, is a company based at UBC, uh, Dr. Andre Mar Marziali. It, he created, I don't have a, a, a picture of his original prototype, um, that um, what it does is takes high frequency uh, electric fields and uses that to uh, and rotates them around and use them to concentrate DNA. So it's a really a, a sample preparation machine. And so uh, based on that, uh, he wanted to raise capital. So we actually made him this prototype here. And so with that, he was able to attract some pretty, they raised $25 million from a very sophisticated uh, California investors, brought in a, a CEO to match with him. And then they commercialized this product here. And that company's still alive, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what they're up to at the moment. But he's a very, very brilliant guy uh, and quite entrepreneurial as well. Outset Medical is a uh, home hemodialysis machine, just went public. We did this project in 2008, so it only took 12, 12 short years. Uh, they're now worth $2 billion U.S. dollars, and, uh, and, the, and this is a wonderful journey as well. I'm running a little short on time, so I won't... Uh, but it was actually started from the, uh, a professor at, in Oregon uh, who had come up with a technology for uh, filtering for, for the, the actually dialyzer approach using microfluidics. And then they licensed in some technology for dialyzer mixing and they came up with a value proposition that we're, they were gonna allow dialysis to happen at home uh, at night, every day. So, uh, but uh, the reason it took 12 years is because that's a very high risk thing to take something that's normally done under medical supervision that's life and death and do it at home every night. Although it's much better for the patient, uh, it's got a lot of risk in it. In fact, they end up after 12 years, uh, they got rid of the custom dialyzer. They're still doing dialysate mixing, like mixing the chemistry on the fly. And they're in center. Uh, so they're not at home yet. But so that gives you an idea of, of what it takes for something of this kind of level of risk and complexity to actually commercialize. It's not an overnight uh, uh, affair. And the last example I want to share with you today is the, our story of the, the Winnipeg ventilator. So on the left here, you see uh, Pierre, no, no, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, he, met, he says, oh, we're doing a deal with Starfish to, to, make, uh, to make ventilators and uh, we're going to make 10,000 of them. And um, and uh, we actually did not have a deal with them at that time, but uh, that, that that certainly helps give an give an impulse to the uh, to the government uh, people who needed to do the deal. And so we launched into this program. This was in April. And so very very quickly we came up with a concept, uh, and I'll, and it was actually based on some pioneering work that had been done 30 years before by a professor in Winnipeg, Dr. Magda Yunus. I'll show you him in a sec. And uh, so we actually took his original prototype that he'd made, which had licensed off, it, it, it made good money for the university. He's a very, very successful innovator in, in, in that setting. And, um, and then uh, 
we turned that this this down here is the rendering we figured out within the first four weeks and then just a huge pile of work that we've done over the course of the last uh, six months and it's just starting to, to do manufacturing right now uh, all this uh, made in Canada uh, initiative so uh, I'll tell you more about that if you want to ask questions about that but the story about Dr. Yunus, this is him here. He's in his late 80s now. He's as active as ever. This is the very first thing that he made. Uh, and it was quite a revolutionary uh, ventilator at the time. And um, so he um, actually developed it to the point where he did clinical testing on it and then actually got a major corporation uh, called Puritan Bennett to license it. And uh, they actually commercialized it and built it into a very successful product over over uh, more than a decade. So at the time when uh, we were all, there was a big crisis of ventilators in Canada, uh, then uh, this was one of the technologies that was available to commercialize in Canada. So we picked it up and we developed it into this. And here he is, very proud of both of these devices that are his own, his children in some regards. So that are that's my thoughts. Hope that uh, hit, hit the mark of what you're interested in talking about today. Um, what, what uh, it, as a, as a uh, professor or a researcher, how should you think about entrepreneurship? Um, and how should you think about what ventures are worth starting? And if you do start, if you do decide that your ventures were starting, how should you think about the right product to start? And how do you think broadly enough? And then... Uh, I didn't have a, as much chance as I might have liked to get, dig into some of those examples, but hopefully you found them interesting and maybe inspiring. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Scott, for for, for inspiring journey and uh, all these stories are really great. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's great that the Canadian biotech companies, uh, I mean, involved in many projects and many products. Uh, so. Uh, we got one question, but it, I, I, I prefer to ask my question about the regulatory affairs because once we have the product and uh, you know we have to go to this long uh, pass of FDA approval and regulatory affairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? And uh, I mean, in in, in your uh, I mean in your uh, uh, phase one pathfinder that you mentioned, you. You check that you know the product is uh, <clears throat> is uh, kind of uh, uh, approved will be approved by the by the FDA or needs FDA approval or I mean you you pick a product that uh, needs uh, less uh, regulation or more regulation you know how how do yeah you that's a, it's a it's a big can of worms as you as you reference. Um, you know, once you've been through it a few times, it's it's like anything else. It's just like getting a grant or something, right? It's a it's a process that you do. Um, um, so uh, thinking about that, uh, you know, the regulators tend to group by risk. They have different classes, risk classes, uh, and there's different jurisdictions. Of course, all the all the countries and have their own regulatory. There's a CE mark which covers all of Europe. Now, Britain has just split theirs apart again, but I think it'll probably look a lot like the CE mark. Uh, uh, there's a Japanese one, there's a Chinese one, there's a Canadian one, there's an American one, and most of the rest of the world um, sort of references off of those ones. Um, so uh, it, it is a somewhat involved and specialized thing uh, that... Uh, you, you know, you have to submit what's called the design history file. Typically, you have to have a quality system. So I didn't really get into that in this talk, but uh, there's, there's a, a quality system needs, this needs to be baked into the actual company. But you're going to have people in your company that know how to do that. So, um, and so a typical class two medium risk device, which which would be a, probably most devices are really class two. <clears throat> um, it, it, the process of actually getting the regulatory clearance is about six months long. But one of the things that uh, it could be as short as three months, but uh, in fact, it's it's even heard of to be faster than that. <clears throat> but one of the hard things in entrepreneurship, in medtech entrepreneurship, is that the time when you're doing that is when you're all scaled up and you've got all this burn for payroll for your sales team getting trained and, and manufacturing transfer and buying inventory and all that. And yet there's all this uncertainty. So it's also a time of loss of value for the founder. And uh, 
because the value of your company somewhat relates to the risk of regulatory. So uh, whatever you can do to manage that. We just had one, it was a dental robotics one we're working on. And so what you can do uh, is you can have a meeting with the regulator. It's called a pre-sub, pre-submission meeting. Um, so, and we presented that it should be a, a, a class two, which is in 510K is the name of the application or the name of the, of the clearance that you can get. And, and the FDA confirmed that it was a, a, a 510K path because it could have been a, a much worse outcome. So just by that, we believe the value of the company raised by about $5 million, just, just by the FDA clarifying what the path is. So it's, it's very, very consequential. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of quite good consultants around the industry, definitely worth having some expertise and not just fuddling through it yourself. Um, that's my thought. Thank you so much. Mohsen, do you, do you like to ask a question? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, for your very nice presentation. I kind of relate to, to, uh, to most of the, uh, the concept that you you talked about, and you know why, of course. I mean, we've talked about these uh, issues uh, a lot uh, over the past few months uh, that we had, and then you gave us a, a, a number of good advices. Uh, but uh, about the regulatory, so I have a follow-up question about that, and then I have a couple of other mm -hmm. questions that I would like to, to ask you. Uh, so you mentioned that, uh, Obtaining the clearance takes six months, but is that, did you uh, also uh, consider the uh, the time that we need to yeah, do the clinical trial? So, that, that, so, if, um, that so if a typical class two doesn't really need trials, you don't have to register a trial, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you do, uh, and that varies. So the, the path varies somewhat. So that just the six months is just the time where you send, but from the day that you send in the application that you've been preparing for months until you, the, the regulators are typically required to get back to you within three months. But sometimes they just come back with questions. And then you need to address the questions with whatever you need to do, some of which may require significant work. And then you resubmit the answers to your questions. And then they have another 90 days to come up with more questions. So it's so that's where the risk is. Maybe this whole thing could take a year if you don't manage yourself well. Meanwhile, you're burning the fifty thousand dollars a month of salaries and whatever. So, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. I completely understand. I just wanted to make because because uh, you also need. Uh, I mean, based. I mean, my understanding uh, so far is that even if you want to get into. Uh, Clinical. Let's say there is a medical device that needs clinical. So let's say there is an implant yeah. that you want to just you know uh, test it on humans, and then it has to go mm -hmm. through all these clinical trials. Uh, uh, so uh, so do you need to get yeah. like let's say Health Canada oh, yeah. approval the, uh, to do so it for Health uh, Canada, for example? There's something called an investig investigational testing authorization, uh, which in the U.S. is called an IDE investigational device whatever, uh, I forget the E stands for. Um, um, basically, you get permission from the regulator to say it's okay to do this test. It'd be also, but you also have to get it cleared by the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the, the risk management group at each of the, any, with the hospitals that want to do this. So that's a, so, uh, um, and so, it, there's there's a fair amount of bureaucracy. If you have to test something like 500 patients or something, and maybe you got to do multi-site, that's where the money starts exploding. Uh, especially if you're working on if you're working on a say a heart valve or something, you're going to be paying ten or twenty thousand dollars for every patient to, to maybe more, the, the, maybe maybe a hundred thousand. You know, you can see if you have to, you know, you can see how the money turns into many tens of millions in a screaming hurry, right? So it's a um, so, yeah, so design for clinical is a huge, huge piece. It's yeah. kind of underappreciated. Uh, even as you're conceiving the venture, how do you think about the clinical endpoints? And, yeah. what, and what, what, how do you reduce the risk that you'll fail your clinical endpoints? Yeah. And there's a lot of companies that are dead now, just not because their device didn't work, just because they didn't imagine their clinicals, right? Yeah. 
Exactly. They raised their money and they did their trial wrong or they did the wrong trial or something. And, uh, and, uh, and they never had a chance to go raise more money. So. Yeah. Yeah. And what is your advice? So let's say that, uh, cause God, there are many of these, uh, many of us, uh, like those who are in the participants in this, in this, uh, uh, e-seminar series, they're working on devices that are probably implantable. Uh, or maybe there is something that uh, they're developing a material or some cells in them, and then they have to be injected in the body uh, for regenerative purposes. Uh, so what is your advice to them in terms of getting ready for, you know, doing all these, going through all these processes? Yeah. So my first advice is, you know, it's, it's, this, it's, the, it's sort of one of the themes of the talk is start with the end in mind, right? Okay. How do you make sure you think as you're conceiving the thing and you're imagining what you're going to do and how you're going to raise the money at what value and that you, that you're not just kicking that can down the road of how do you think about clinical that's yeah. that's, that's something you you don't have to have it all designed but you have in principle how many yeah. patients do you think you're going to need to test uh what, what do you think it's going to cost for each of those what are the what's the risk you're trying to adjust with that and what outcome do you want um and then get an idea of what it would take and I, honestly, I think the single biggest thing you can do is actually go find someone who's done something similar before and get them to add them to your advisory board. Okay. Give them some shares and get them to advise you because all of this stuff is not obvious and you, and there's no need to figure it all out with, like, on your own. Because you know what happens the first time you try to do some fixing in your house or something. It takes you four times as long and you get it wrong, but it helps you figure out how to do it the next time. So how about if you... Exactly. You answered my next question and then... For most of because most of us we do not we have not gone through all these you know regulatory processes and yeah. then you answered my question it's a it's a very uh, uh, basically wise approach so Huvan if you let me I have one more question to ask <laughs> I, I don't know uh, Scott how much time do you have uh, uh, yeah, for, I should uh, check my calendar here I think that I'm probably booked uh, I, I'm flexible for the next. Uh, half hour so i can go at whatever time you want but uh. okay we usually go up to uh, 10 30 so that's great that's great okay. uh, so you talked about market size and when when you want to think about your product you think about market size you say okay so let's see uh if my product is targeting a larger market or a smaller market and if it's targeting a smaller market then you know what maybe it's not a good idea to to commercialize it but let's talk about the larger markets uh, kind of uh, sure. uh, so a good example is covid right now yeah, yeah absolutely uh, let's look at the it's a, it's, a, it's the largest market at the moment and then let's look at these uh testing uh devices uh, like yeah, right. mm -hmm. that's a that's a good example of mm -hmm. uh, a, a product that has a very large market but my question is that although the product, this testing product, has a very large market, but there are many, many people are working in that market. So, what is what, what is your advice in terms yeah, of that's wonderful? That market? Yeah, I I'm a little bit scared of the COVID market. That say uh, that mostly I'm attracted to things where your device uh, is going to be fairly unique and it's, it's, it's a special solution and you're confident by the time you get through the couple of years to, to figure it all out, which it could be longer, that uh, there's going to be a substantial market waiting for you. I think COVID is one of those things that uh, um, there's so many ways it could go. Six months from now, we could all be saying, oh, remember COVID? Yeah. Or, or it could be uh, that there's still a lot of COVID around the world, but not so much in the major cities anymore. And uh, um, and so that the market evolves to being more of a uh, rural and third world kind of market. And, yeah. uh, um, uh, and I think, and what are they, something like a hundred vaccines being worked on right now? I guarantee five years from now, there will not be a hundred vaccines on the market. Yeah. And, uh, that there's going to be people spending hundreds of millions of dollars on their vaccines that don't get, even get commercialized at all. And, uh, uh, so it's so rapidly changing and so crowded that I think going after a mainstream application is actually kind of crazy right now, unless you are unless you have some huge advantage. There's some reason why you're 10 times better than everybody else. Um, but just saying you have another diagnostic that, that's gonna be similar to 20 other ones. Imagine what the, uh, what the I, I try to imagine 
say in ventilators even. Imagine what the uh, what the uh, uh, critical care uh, meetings are going to look like uh, in about a year. Yeah. There's, you know what, what when you go into the technical exhibition, how many ventilator booths are there going to be? Yeah. Exactly. That everybody's trying to sell ventilators. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a horrible disaster. It's what it's going to end. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 that's all. I, I, but if you think a couple steps beyond, what are going to be the consequential changes of COVID? There's going to be a lot of interest in uh, knowing if COVID is in an environment somehow. There's going to be uh, people feeling safe to work, maybe with some air cleaning or some uh, or some way to get people back to the office will be a big market of that. So if I think it's always helpful to kind of think of the second order type solutions. Exactly. And then another thing about these technologies, and I agree with you, it's, uh, and it's, uh, COVID was just an example. There are other areas that are, are pretty crowded as well uh, mm -hmm. when, you, when you try to enter them. But mm -hmm. another thing that may be worth thinking about on the positive side is that the mm -hmm. technologies that will be developed during this, you know, hype, of like yeah. can be used maybe for other applications. So these uh, vaccine technologies, maybe the infrastructure can be used later on for another application. I think that's totally true. true. Right, so you have to be smart about that. So it's interesting to see Abcelera in Vancouver. I don't know if you've been following their story. Yeah, yeah. But they, they, they just timed things brilliantly by accident that uh, they, uh, they, uh, they had developed this rapid antibody uh, development or, or finding technology, right? They can they can test three hundred thousand antibodies over the course of uh, of a few hours. Yeah. Where other people are sitting there with pipettes. Yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> Carlos, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, those guys are they've just you know they're, they're going to be public. They're going to be worth multiple billions of dollars. And that all just rapidly that just happened, right? Maybe okay. they were on a path to that anyways, but. What was supposed to take five or ten years took one year instead, um, yeah. and uh, I I, to I totally agree in terms of cell therapies. The cell therapies have been slow, right? In terms of their adoption, um, I mean, there's I shouldn't be too bold in that. Biologics is a is an industry that's been floating around, but uh, you know, um, we thought there would be more market on cell therapy type devices, and it's been slow for developing for us, um, but. I think there are things that that will be accelerated. That uh, uh, whole new fields that uh, people just they got funded to try. You know, academics if they're good at anything, it's it's figuring out how to get money, right? And, uh, and so they, that uh, I think, as governments have sprinkled out money disproportionately towards things that have COVID applications, people will find other things for them. Totally agree. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Human, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you. Me, uh, any questions and then the participants they have questions as well so uh, you got a couple of questions i think uh, you talked about venture capital uh yeah one of our, uh, one of our participants mazhar is asking if you can elaborate more about founding uh, proper or suitable uh, potential venture capital uh mm -hmm. yeah. how to find venture capital is that the question how yeah find, uh, the, i think the, the, okay i think the most important uh thing to understand about venture capital is that it's not the right path for every venture uh there is a their, their venture capital story has the potential to return them 10 or 20 times their money back and they only want to come in uh typically uh once it's clear that uh you're solving an important problem that's large right that it, this thing could be a potential billion dollar story it's, it's it's amazing to to but it, and they also have large funds. They need to put their money to work in big chunks. They need to put, um, you know, several million to twenty million dollars or fifty million dollars to work, and then have the ability to get ten times their money back. So it's not exciting for them to to put five hundred thousand dollars or a million to work and hope that maybe they'll get five million back out again. That's a uh, um, so. So typically, companies are not ready right out of the gate to attract venture capital. It can happen that you've just got some giant breakthrough and it's a huge market and you need to run really fast. We've seen that before, but those are pretty rare. Um, so more typical is that uh, you you do you know you raise money from people who know you or from grants plus people who know you, and grants is actually. Um, 
uh, a bit of a uh, golden handcuff, sir. It, what we find people who are grant focused and try to spin their companies up with grants, um, they get stuck there. And then they never they never develop the discipline they need or the, the arguments they need to raise uh, commercial capital. Uh, so I'll watch out for that one. Um, so typically, uh, what they call friends and family round, people that know you for, or trust you for some reason, I mean, and they're giving you money in ten or twenty thousand dollar pieces. Um, and then typically, you would do an angel. You get to the spot where you venture. I know you know all this, but. Uh, um, gets to a, a stage where you can attract money and use money in, you know, $200,000 at a time or $500,000 at a time. Uh, that's the angel round. And typically by the time your, your company is worth uh, maybe $5 million or so, or maybe $10 million and you've, and you've got a couple of million dollars in, you filed some patents. It's clear what the regulatory is. It's clear what the size of the market is. Uh, you understand the buying decisions for your, 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 your customers. Um, uh, you've got some benchtop risk reduction, you filed some patents, uh, you understand uh, regulatory and reimbursement landscape. That's, and now, and the story all stacks up. Now you have a story, you're ready to go. And, 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 and I should add, reiterate that by, in, in order to have a venture capital story, you need to have a team that's done it before. You know, not, not wholesale, but what I mean is that there need to be people on your team and on your advisory board and on your board Who've, uh, who've, who've uh, achieved what you're hoping to achieve. That, 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 that's what venture capitalists want to invest in. That's their biggest risk is that you as a startup entrepreneur are gonna somehow drop the ball because you don't know what you're doing. So uh, all that's very achievable, but you have to have a picture of how that goes. So, and, and as, as I mentioned, Montreal, get Steve Arliss to come talk to you. He's done this a few times before and he's been really successful at it. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Karina uh, has a question uh, about the regulatory and uh, quality assurance pathway. Uh, basically, I think uh, she's she's asking you if it's better to hire regulatory affairs expert or train engineers um, in regulatory affairs, and uh, how company improve handling complaints and improve their product verification and validation processes. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think there's a few ways to answer that. First of all, regulatory experts are very expensive. So you do, um, uh, you, they're mostly used for strategy and uh, you still do need engineers or uh, 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 quality people uh, inside your company who are going to do, the, do that work that you can afford to pay every day to come to work and prepare documents and so on. So I would say, yeah, I'd say both, but uh, Hoping that a newly trained engineer that you've sent to a course on regulatory which should be in charge of the whole destiny of your company, I think is also a bad, bad idea. So, so you have to find sort of mix of both. Uh, what was the other question? Something that, something. Uh, the other question, uh, uh, you know, a follow up. How can a company improve handling complaints and oh, improve right. the product verification and validation process? Yeah, well, okay. So complaints is a post-market activity. So by the time you're there, you're a pretty sophisticated company. You've already figured out how to develop your company, you manufactured, transferred it, you got a regulatory clearance, you figured out how to distribute it, and you have customers, and now they're starting to complain. So uh, it's a required element. It's called, it's called post-market surveillance. It's uh, required under all the regulatory regimes. Um, so how do you improve that? I think that was the question. Um, yeah. So actually, interestingly enough, what tends to happen now, most startups don't really have to worry about that because they're going to sell themselves. Their investors require a return and they don't want to wait around 15 years for this company to slowly start selling things. And uh, uh, so uh, typically what happens in the larger companies is that, uh, you know, different departments take over and all the, 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 the people who created the product or move on to other things or they're gone or something. And so actually customer complaint files in practice, if you look at the uh, at the FDA warning letters, for example, then they're all public and go take a, take a look at the, see the things that cause the regulator to go into conniptions. A lot of them related to customer complaints. Uh, they tend to accumulate and they sit in the sort of uh, commercial department, but they don't actually get fed back to update the risk analysis or update the specifications or do mitigations. 
we worked on one product actually. Uh, we were asked to do some regulatory update for it. Um, it's a surgical product. It had been on the market for 20 years. And uh, and and so we asked, well, since we're going to do some regulatory updates, maybe let us take a look at the at the at the customer complaints and see what what's in there. Um, and they turned out they'd actually had a customer die. They 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 like there was, uh, which I'm sure was not a surprise to them, but but it wasn't not informing our our uh, our work. So we were actually able to uh, um, um, update the product to reduce the the risk to patients as well. Um, so. So that's not so much something a startup needs to really think about, but ultimately it's a, a more mature company has to make sure somehow to connect their customer feedback back to the uh, sort of founding documents. And that's, that, that's where you can get into trouble with the regulator. And then the other question was, again. I think uh, that would be, that uh, was the question, but there is another question from a medical doctor, Sheila is mm -hmm. asking, uh, 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 how she can uh, kind of involve into entrepreneurship and the uh, medical device world uh, to gain more experience in medical device business. What advice can you provide uh, to someone like Sheila, who is a medical doctor or a flow in Western University uh, okay. regarding what position I, he, she could apply for attaining the experience in uh, medical device or entrepreneurship? And uh, yeah, that's great. So okay, so as a medical doctor, MD, PhD sounds like um, uh, orthopedic surgery research. Um, that's a great place to start because it's, it's in our world. Um, there's this this uh, term KOLs we use. Everybody throws this term around KOLs. That's a it's a key opinion okay. leader. <laughs> it's basically influential doctors, um, and. Uh, so if you're an expert, if you're a researcher, you're obviously an expert in the things that you're researching. Uh, there, there probably are startups uh, uh, that are involved in your field. There may be even more mature companies involved in your field, um, but they may not be at your university. But uh, uh, it, it's you know very possible to become a consultant as new things, uh, as you bump into things in your travels. So just I think just being willing and interested in broadcasting that around that that will attract people who want to work with you. Um, um, and uh, and then you can bring a lot of your clinical expertise. Typically that would involve sitting as a clinical advisory board member for a company, uh, uh, participating in calls every month or something every week, or maybe uh, uh, there might be some uh, clinical research questions that come up that they need to reduce risk in their venture. And then, um, uh, they would pay you to do that work, for example, or you could convert that into shares, or maybe you could even spin it up into getting a grad student to work on something. I mean, there, there's uh, everything's possible, right? But it just starts by being willing and having taking initiative. Great. Um, so there is a new question come uh, just came in. Uh, so Nedo is asking if, uh, assuming that we can manufacture our product in a small scale, uh, what will be the best way to approach our early adapters? Yes. Uh, okay. So um, there's a couple of the, so sort of. Um, I think the the best way to think about this is probably think about the the lean startup model. Um, the Eric Reese wrote a book uh, called The Lean Startup, and, uh, and there's another company called uh, by, called Value Proposition Design by Osterwalder. Um, and uh, what's what's interesting to to, to think about is uh, how do you reduce risk sequentially and efficiently? Um, and so launch in the lean startup model is not like you do everything perfectly and then you launch the, the perfect, perfectly crafted thing. Launch is you start, you start uh, selling something that is what they would uh, maybe call a, a mi minimum commercializable product. People throw around this MVP idea, minimal viable product, uh, which is, um, but anyway, you basically want to launch somewhat immature because uh -huh. launch is an experiment. It's a, uh, you don't know how people are going to act towards your product until you try them. So, and, and it, this all relates to the question of what your target endpoint is. 
Uh, if you're trying to validate your market, because that will give you a big value bump, and then you'll get into negotiations with buyers. Uh, what's really important to actually, there's a few things that are important in there. Um, um, that, I mean, you'll obviously have a bunch of clinical people that you've been talking to all along and, and they've been testing out the product. They've been telling other people they really like it and so on. Um, so how do you actually uh, get your first customers? Maybe that the first real commercial customers. Um, um, well, you can hire a salesperson to manage that or you can just approach them yourself. It's a, but, and your, your uh, advisors, clinical advisors should have networks into the people that ultimately are gonna be your first customers. Uh, and you can do it yourself. Um, uh, this, is, this, this relates closely to the value of your company and what target endpoint you're trying to get to. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of broadening out the question. I'm not really an expert on the, the specific tactics, what you should put in your slide deck to get them to buy it and so on. But of course you do have to understand how they're gonna get paid, what their commercial interest is. And if you go talk to them, they'll tell you what their commercial interest is and what you need to do to sell it. And if you've been doing your homework all along, you should generally know that already because why would you have got this far if you didn't know what they were gonna buy it or why, how much they're willing to pay for it and so on. So I think I kind of meandered around that topic. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. Uh, Mohsen, would you like to jump in and ask a question or? Uh... Because I know that you have lots of questions since you are uh, experiencing uh, some uh, uh, I mean, challenges. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I'll just ask one question. Uh, it's more about your decision to start your company. Uh, yeah. it's a, it's, it might be a challenge. Why did you decide to start your own company? Uh, you know, I think most, like most entrepreneurs, it's not really driven by money so much as it's driven by uh, autonomy, wanting to be able to, to do my own thing. Wanting, I was really just trying to make myself a job, honestly. Yeah. And I was willing to live. And, you know, people think of entrepreneurs as being huge risk takers. Um, for me, it was really just uh, being willing to live with the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, I mean, I wasn't risking that much per se, except maybe I wouldn't get paid. But uh, so, uh, um, and then lo and behold, there was a lot of pain in the middle of there. The early days was quite easy because it was just being contractor. But as I started taking on bigger projects, and then I started to take on the risk that whether people would pay us or not, and we, there was no capital to fund any of that risk. So there was a lot of pain in the middle of all that. But that's a, that's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. That, uh, that's, that's fair. So you are, I mean, you wanted your adrenaline level to be always high, probably. Uh, uh, you know, you, you get accustomed to a certain amount of uncertainty in your life and uh, that's uh, maybe I'm just wired that way. Uh, there's certain people are wired to be very flexible minded and, uh, and I'm kind of one of those people more of the creative end of the spectrum. I think that's probably not atypical. Well, I think maybe entrepreneurs are distinguished by our bad imaginations. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that, that's, uh, again, it depends on, on the personality. But it's great to see that uh, we have we have different people with different personalities. And then that's that's how, uh, what drives us. Like, you yeah, know, exactly. But, uh, well, well, thank you very much. I mean, I don't have any other question at the moment. Uh, Just, so we, uh, we got one more question about... Uh, Mahdi is asking uh, about personal protective equipment uh, in connection yeah. to COVID. Uh, yeah. He wants to know your opinion about self-sanitizing PPE based on biopolymer incorporation into plastic to prevent uh, to prevent airborne pathogen transmission. I, this is so <laughs> detailed, but uh, yeah, it is a detailed question. Uh, so that's probably a good idea. Uh, yeah. You know whether people would buy it or not i don't know you know i think that whole uh fomites thing has got overplayed in the early days that can can you really catch covid by touching things seems like that's not a not a major path um so is it in practice actually make a difference can you measure it don't know but it, there might be an opportunistic play to I mean uh, it sounds good that might be enough to get people to buy it but what, what I will caution you, if you do decide to do that, I have a friend who has a PPE company that makes uh, 
self-adhesive masks for, for hair salons. And, and uh, what he found is that uh, all of these social media companies basically prevent his advertising. There was so much scamming going on in the early days of COVID that it's really, really hard to, to, uh, to market uh, uh, PPEs right now. That's cool. That's true. Thank you so much, Scott, uh, for taking time and uh, to answer all the questions. Uh, and uh, I just want to finish off uh, today's uh, session by uh, just uh, encouraging everybody to, to uh, attend our next seminar uh, next week, uh, Wednesday, uh, and at the same time. Uh, with Professor Komechawa from University of Toronto that uh, she founded and co-founded a uh, few companies. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And thank you so much, uh, Scott, uh, for joining yeah. us. And uh, Mohsen, thank you. Thank you. Very have, much. A great, have a great day all. Okay. Bye -bye. Very much. Bye.